I am. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. And we would like to also extend a welcome to you. We appreciate you all attending. We know that non-credit coding is not always the most exciting. It's not going to your musical, um, but it is important. And uh, there'll be a lot of information that we're going to share today, as well as um, sort of walk you through some of the processes that we use. Um, we'll be looking at I just want to introduce myself. I work, I'm a senior program manager at um, West Ed, as well as accompanied by my colleagues and just a delightful person to work with, um, Jessica Chittapong. If you want to um, unmute and turn your camera on and just say a quick hello, Jessica, introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Jessica Chittapong here. I'm a project coordinator at West Ed and um, current lead of the adult education dashboards. I've been supporting the um, launch for data tools now for a few years. So happy to be here. And she she is, she will answer all the technical questions that you will have. So she's um, fabulous. But we'll just go ahead and get started. So really what we're hoping to um, accomplish here today is learn a little bit more about the AP dashboard, the build process, explore the MDD, which is the metrics um, definition dictionary, which is Huge, and we're hoping to like demystify that a little bit so that it becomes a resource that you all can use. We're going to highlight some key metrics. We're also going to spend a little bit of time highlighting some of the new metrics and our process for updating the metrics, maybe why, and then briefly touch on like features like the export, you know, quick learning, the process for correcting data, um, and that's basically what we'll wrap up with. Um, are we're really excited? Part of this is to this is to um, set the stage for the launch of the new um, the of the adult education dashboard 4.0, and that will be launching April 26. So we're really excited about it, but it also means that people are really are quite quite busy. Um, so that's that's where we are today, and we entertain any questions that you might have, even if they're not exactly on topic. So. Um, please feel free to use the chat or open your mic. Jessica and I are both very informal presenters, so we are fine with being interrupted. Um, and sometimes it's easier because I know when people use the icon to lift their hand, which is very polite, I tend to miss it. So feel free to say, excuse me, I have a question. That's all um, super for us. Um, so we're also, I wanted to say that in when we're highlighting the key metrics, they're not necessarily brand new metrics, but they are metrics that sometimes go underused. And so we're hoping that by talking a little bit more about them, bringing them to the forefront, as you begin to think about coding and planning to use your data, that those are more forward in your mind. So I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. One of the things we're trying to do is be very transparent about our processes. So she's going to look, talk a little bit about what goes into the dashboard build process and why we build a new dashboard um, at least once a year. Thanks, Blair. Um, feel free to go to the next slide if that's okay. All right. So. Um, I apologize for the simplicity of this slide. As you can see, I'm a data person and not a designer, um, but uh, we've tried to map out the, uh, the key activities for the adult education build that happens throughout the year. And um, just wanna emphasize that this is a, a pretty long process. It's very iterative and it, it happens simultaneously with a number of other launch board data tool builds as well. And so, so keep that in mind while I, while I overview the process. Um, we start the year really in July. Um, one, continuing trainings on um, what was built in the previous year, as well as starting the plan planning process with the Chancellor's Office, uh, Cape team, um, as well as some other uh, strategic leadership as well. And we work a lot with partners, uh, including both CASAS, as well as our coding partners from Education Results Partnership to really plan and review what worked and what didn't work from the last build process and uh, figure out what we want to implement for uh, the upcoming year. Um, so that happens throughout the fall and um, between fall and winter, we really take the time to update uh, the technical, technical documentations needed um, specifically for our coders and um, to support resource development for the field as well. We receive um, 
annual data files from both Cost of Top Scroll Enterprise as well as the Chancellor's Office Management Information System uh, in December and January. So um, the CASAS folks give us a specific CAPE um, data export, um, usually within mid-December. And then we get a um, export from the Chancellor's Office sometime in mid-January um, to incorporate into our new builds. Um, during that year, we're setting up the foundation, we're doing all the coding, um, and then uh, we're able to test and do quality assurance um, early spring. And then uh, ideally our uh, releases, it happens sometime in the spring, usually uh, end of March or mid-April. Um, and then the rest of the year, we, we try to do trainings with you all. Um, what you see here is the, just the key activities. There's a lot of little steps that go into that. And as you can see, if one thing goes wrong, everything else gets shifted. So that's, um, that's just part of the build process and something we have to deal with um, as we update yearly. Uh, so next slide, Blair. So this slide I've just stolen from the Chancellor's Office uh, site and um, trying to make sense of what the colleges submit versus what we get um, as part of the launch for team. And um, as this is a pretty much the non-credit focus, we're gonna be focused a lot on the, the MIS data elements. So as uh, we've been, if you look at the uh, yellow arrows, that's kind of where I flagged which files we really need um, from the MIS system to incorporate into the adult education pipeline. And so, um, as you can see, colleges may be submitting at different points in the year, but we really only get the data um, once in January. So I wanted to point this out and I wanted to flag the specific uh, data files that we rely on to, to really power the build. And it's, it's mainly going to be uh, student files as well as the course file. Sorry, Jessica, when do we get the CASAS file? We get the CASAS file uh, usually mid-December. And I just pointed that out because I know that you all receive um, summary reports, the CAPE reports, which um, summarize your, your CASAS data on a quarterly basis, but we receive the, fi the full file only once a year. Right. Any questions before we move on? So the dashboard we structure really to focus on the learner um, and therefore it's designed to follow the learner's educational journey. And it starts at you know, students and programs, which is where the learner is and their enrollment. And then it looks at the progress one makes while in programming, then to transitions and then onto success and then ultimately um, the employment and earnings. And we call these the key student progress metrics. We'll still show up here underneath them. You can see how they're categorized. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with them already, but um, that's just how they, they break out into our, into the, onto the dashboard. And we collect ma um, data on each one of those. But we also don't want you to lose sight of the fact that this is really, we really see it as the learner journey. And while we start out with the learners in the programs. And so for example, which is, you know, we'll talk about some, you know, a student who enrolls in the CTE and then as they journey on throughout their um, trajectory. Um, and, but as such, we also know that all the learners are different with different goals and different trajectories. So we also account for entry and exit points that track across the academic year um, and or their journey, right? So they have the arrows, that means that they exit. But just because they exit, we like to point out that there is also data. The data also shows up, should they either do a, um, a gain, um, uh, uh, an, an educational um, functioning level gain, or if they end up being enrolled, that those will show up in your different different parts of the bucket site, right? just because they exit doesn't mean that they don't get tracked in the system. Um, 
they so that also that as a coding note, it's really important to collect the data in that first bucket, the learner and programs um, of that journey, because they these data points also affect how data is attributed to learners and your institution um, across the uh, across the year in the dashboard. So, for example, ensuring that the learners attendance or enrollment are captured influence whether the participant metric is activated. Right, and the participant is a, is different from the reportable individual, which Jessica will talk a little bit about more about later. Um, we try and make the dashboard as complete as possible uh, until we identify new outcomes to measure, or we receive feedback from you all as the field to add additional measures that or that are meaningful to chart in the student's progress and the possible relationship to the services. For example, we just held field testing on this dashboard and got some really great feedback both on what worked and some of the pieces that people would like to see, which we can then um, think about and see if it is able to be incorporated into the dashboard. And that's one of the reasons why when we hold these say, oh, they're new metrics, this is part of the rationale for that. So the MDD is your go-to resource. It, um, and it does definitely appear to be unwieldy. Uh, we know due to the amount of information in it. Um, however, if you know how to come at it, it becomes less overwhelming. And for me, I put these stairs here because when I first started working at West Ed on the AEP, I did not want to touch the, dash, the MDD at all. <laughs> and yet, as I explore it more, it always reminds me of like going into the different parts of a library, you know, like opening and exploring a secret. And that's what, you know, the MDD should be. It's not, it shouldn't be so overwhelming, but rather it um, should be perceived as going into like that basement room in the, in the library. Um, and realizing that it's an entree into the dashboard coding process, it gives you absolutely all the information that you will need to know. So for example, you have all the data points, you can find out all the institutions that are tracked for the dashboard. Um, it will tell you about the displays and then um, any of the limitations or ca uh, caveats, as well as in this part about where it says all metrics, it lists all related Comas and Casas tops pro enterprise. So if you're wondering what you should be coding or where those data points are coming from, they will tell you that and will also give you the calculations. So, and we have for each of these, they have a metric ID, which would be the number and then the label, which is for in this example, reportable individuals. And, but also in the naming conventions, they all have numbers and they are sequenced so that they start with the lower numbers in those initial buckets and then they continue to um, move up so that they're actually mirroring the learner journey by structuring the trajectory by increasing numbers. And once again, I like to just make a plug for remember that what you code in the journey affects other counts um, and uh, so that you wanna make sure that your information is complete. So I'm just going to walk you through what we call as the information about a metric that you're going to find. And this is part of why the MDD appears so long is because we take every metric and break it down this way. It will include that metric ID and the label um, and the following fields, which I'm going to walk through. There's a description. There's the student type. So this one is about participants in ESL. So we're looking at adult education ESL. Display is what it will look like on the um, dashboard. and then Importantly, these are the data sources that we use to inform this metric, right? So we pull data from both um, TOPS Pro and from COMIS. Other piece that is um, important is that it will show you the breakdown for each of those sources, right? So here's the TOPS Pro. This will tell you where the data is coming from. And then this is how it will tell you how we get the information on the dashboard. What do we include in that calculation? Um, so here's the calculation for the participant. And then because it's for ESL, we're also looking for somebody who's enrolled in ESL. Um, and as I said, it's a lot of information. For COMIS, Similarly, we um, have that information and it allows you to also um, cross-reference that you're completing all the fields needed to correctly calculate outcomes on the AEP dashboard, right? And these, because we have access to the COMIS um, definitions dictionary, 
that you can actually, these are all live links. So if you have any questions about this, when you're looking at what going into Comus, you can click on that. It will take you over into the Comus section, into the Comus um, definitions dictionary, and you'll be able to access and understand what's going on there. Cheryl's asking if there's a discrepancy of TE and Comus, and what's the uh, rule for resolving this in terms of the metric used in launch board? That's a great question. Thank you, Cheryl. And it's one that I know we wrestle with. As I said, I'm going to let Jessica answer that because I think she'll be able to tell you more about how that works in the calculations. Sure, Blair. Um, so I guess just I'd like to know what uh, specific discrepancy you're referring to, but in terms of counting students, um, we count students in either data system. So if you're not flagged as an ESL student in, in CASAS, but you are flagged as an ESL student in the COMET side of things, you will be counted as an ESL student on the launch board. Um, not sure if that was what you meant, but that's, um, that's how we do the counting. Yeah, or for example, another example would be um, the high school diploma program and then the HSC that's acquired through um, either the GED or the TASC or HiSET. And that while they register differently, we, we look at both of those fields. The HSD usually only appears in Comus. So we will, when we're doing that calculation, we merge those two so that they both become one number. We see them as the equivalent. And so that's, that's how we adjust. Um, we make register equivalencies between the two systems and then merge them together so that they both appear on the dashboard as a singular number. Okay, I'll just continue on. Please, again, post, post, on, post in the chat if you have questions or if that didn't quite clear it up. Um, please feel free to, to continue that discussion. I just wanted to clear, people are asking us, um, are always curious about what's the denominator. And so then we look at, that's listed here as well. And then the numerator is obviously those who meet that criteria. Um, it also will tell you how things are displayed on the dashboard. So for example, for this one, you'll be able to see in percentage and distinct counts. Uh, it will also tell you where you can see and disaggregate the information. So um, the, you'll be able to just see this disaggregated by gender, race, ethnicity, age group, um, and then whether there's a program type or if there's student type. So they won't divide, they won't break it down by CAPE program, but you will be able to see if they're a first time returning or continuing student. And then it also tells you how um, you're aligned with the SSM, if that's um, important for you all. So our, Jessica, again, are there two separate systems and maybe it's deduplicating students? I was just trying to respond on chat, but uh, just quickly, we do do a data match between the two systems using student information, specifically their name, date of birth, and gender, so that we can find the same student in um, both data systems, and we can that way we can um, make sure that we're providing unduplicated accounts. So you don't get counted twice. You only no. get counted once because you because we make a we make a match in the system whether you're in if you're if you appear in both systems we make a match and um, meld them that way. Thanks, Neil. The last section on this will be um, the notes, which is which will tell you um, any uh, help, helpful pointers or it updates you on how a metric may have changed um, and just give you any additional information. So uh, will you show us the examples you're showing now in the PowerPoint in the launch board? I'm not sure. Um, did you want to say more about that? It was two slides uh, before that kind, that. How does that look like? Um, no, um, the next one. How, yeah, how does that look like in launch board? So uh, we had not planned to walk through what the display looks like. I can plug, we'll be having um, two webinars next week that will be really walking through the webinar. 
uh, I mean, through the through the dashboard, but maybe if we move through some of this fairly quickly, we can just pull it up really quickly and um, demonstrate what that looks like. Unless Jessica, do you think do you want to just pull it up and show them what a drill down looks like, um, or should we just go on move through? Um, let's make sure we can get through the content, and then I can circle back to it if we have some extra time. Is that okay? Um, yes. Okay. That should be great. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ollinger. So this is probably um, something we that you already no doubt have in place, but we just want to really suggest that if you don't already do so, that you have a data collection and entry plan in place that talks about the roles and the responsibilities and the routine of um, who collects your data, how it gets collected, when it gets collected, and who actually uh, um, enters and submits that piece. Um, the one piece that people tend not to do on, when they're talking about data collection in an entry plan is that they that people tend to orient the people who are actually involved in the data collection submission plan, but they don't necessarily provide an orientation to all staff working in the program. So we think in part two, um, it's really helpful if you offer an overview of how everyone's work is part of the data system. And it also helps just to keep people simply informed on the possible, on the ways that they're, that they might be able to support the data collection by identifying or keeping clean records. Um, and they might even have a different way of talking about how you might be able to identify and ensure that the data is kept cleanly. Um, we find that the staff that collect the data um, may not also entirely understand how that translates to the work and the role of the institutional researcher, for example, or the data manager, for example. So just a plug for, for, for a data collection and entry plan. Thanks, Blair. Before we move on, I think I, I think there's a lot of uh, questions about getting training for COMIS in general for new staff. And um, our purview is really the launch board um, and adult education pipelines. But I know um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about providing a lot more resources for for the field regarding COMIS in the non-credit side of things. And maybe Neil can uh, talk a little bit about his efforts there. Um, but it is kind of, uh, we're supporting the chancellor's office in thinking about that for the future. And, um, and uh, yeah, even though the reporting schedules are, are pretty set, I think there's a lot of um, local processes as well that, um, that are not set by the chancellor's office that um, need to get worked through. I'll just, I'll just say that. I just, yes. uh, this, is, this is Neil. I would just say yeah. that in, a, in the recent survey, we did a non-credit um, survey of professional development needs. And that was one of the top uh, needs was the COMAS training. So we will bring this up to uh, leadership at the chancellor's office and see uh, how we want to um, you know, uh, meet that need. So more to follow on that. Super. Thanks, Neil. I think that's one of the things that prompted us to start thinking about promoting a data entry um, collection and entry plan, because uh, in some of our conversations, we do know that there's a little bit of a gap between um, how that, you know, when and how and who's collecting that non-credit data um, up to uh, Emma's question about whether where priority lies in that. So thanks. I think that that's super and I'm glad people are talking about that. All right, Jessica, sorry, we barged in, I'll forward on and on to you. Thanks, Blair. Um, yeah, so this next part of it, we, we're gonna do a deep dive into a few select metrics, um, just to walk folks through how, how the metrics are defined and organized and maybe a little bit on how to, how to think through it. And essentially this is, um, this is a summary of what you can find in the metric definition dictionary, um, but broken out in a little bit more of a easy to understand format. So the first couple metrics that I'm gonna be over is going over is uh, really the foundational metrics. So these are the metrics that are, uh, that are calculated and used as the um, starting point for a lot of our other metrics. So, the first metric is the reportable individual um, or adult served metrics. 
And the criteria for that is that we're looking for students who are um, 16 years or older, and um, they either had one hour of enrollment in adult education or non-credit, or they received services, uh, non-credit services or services from um, adult education, regardless of their enrollment status. So for, um, for the CASA side, we get a student, we get a flag if the student was enrolled in a program, and then we get a, a flag if they received any of these particular services. Um, for the COMBA side, we're really looking at student enrollment in non-credit courses. And what you, have, what you see linked here is uh, the specific data element that is associated with that concept. So um, Blair had mentioned a lot about the uh, Chancellor's Office MIS definition dictionary. So if you're really focused on uh, the non-credit coding, uh, definitely click the link and use that as a resource because that is definitely our um, backbone for all of these um, calculations. So what we used to flag a non-credit course is the CBO4 data element. And then uh, we also looked at whether or not they had a one or more uh, positive attendance hours. And that is flagged using the FX05 data element. Um, for this year, what's new is that we are specifically excluding tutoring and supervised study skills um, from the calculation. And that was a decision made uh, from a, a, a working group that happened last fall that decided that that wasn't really uh, in line with the, the adult education programs that we're trying to measure. So those are going to be excluded. Um, additionally, we flag students who um, had a disability using the SD, SDO1 flag. And that's really, um, that's really to meet, because uh, one of our adult education programs is obviously adults with disabilities. So that's one flag we use for that. And then um, for CTE, we're uh, flagging uh, pre-apprenticeship status using the SB23 student flag. There's um, no course flag associated with pre-apprenticeship yet. So that's kind of what, we're, what we ended up with. Um, for non-credit services, uh, we look at the student success data record and we're looking at specifically data elements SS16 and SS20. Now, um, that just seems like a really long grocery list, but it is kind of how we have to work through this to kind of um, get, the, get the information we need uh, for this particular metric. So I'm gonna pause here and make sure that there's no questions regarding reportable individuals. And Jessica, does the 16 plus, did you already answer that? Did this, does the 16 oh. plus overinflate the numbers for CAPE reporting if CAPE is 18 plus? Yeah, um, there's not that many students with who are 16 to, to 18. Um, right now, that's kind of how we're getting the data from CASA. So we are trying to um, match those two data systems. So that's kind of why we, we we defaulted to 16 right now. So it does, I would say theoretically it does inflate it, um, but based on the data, not by, not by much. Okay, so the next um, metric is probably a, one of our main metrics because this is, used as the denominator for all of our outcome metrics. And um, it's really, the easiest way to think about it is that uh, it's all of the adults you served, but they have to meet a 12 hour threshold uh, to be qualified as a participant. And the 12 hours need to specifically happen in one of the uh, California adult ed programs uh, listed in point A under criteria. And so uh, the way we do this for CASAS is, you know, they, they get flagged and then we look at the program hours and then that's that. For the COMA side of things, again, we're looking at student enrollment specifically in non-credit courses in one of the uh, identified CAPE program areas. We're counting um, the 12 positive attendance hours using FX05 across all of the CAPE programs. And then the following, um, the following date points are how we define the specific program areas. 
um, that we are counting. So for ESL, there's um, two ways that we do this. We uh, look at the CV22 data element and it needs to be an A or a B. Or we also look at specific top codes. So CB using the data element CB03, which is the top code element. And then we look at for these uh, top codes listed. So it could either be the CB22 or the specific top code. So that's how we count ESLs. For ABE, um, we're looking at uh, the CB21 data element and uh, specifically the values D through H. Um, and the top code is uh, the, the number listed there. For ASE, we're also looking at CB21 course codes, um, but at the A through C levels with the top with uh, with the top codes uh, listed there. Um, for CTE, again, we're looking at uh, three three possible scenarios for uh, being a CTE program. We can look at the CB22 code of J. We can look at um, all vocational top codes or we can look at the SAM codes uh, that are clearly occupational and above. Um, for adults with disabilities, uh, there's only one way to, to qualify, which is the CB22 equals E. Um, and then for the K-12 success, we're looking at CB22 uh, in the F category and uh, with the specified top codes there. Oh, one thing to note is that um, there was a lot of discussion with the field regarding how to capture SX05, the positive attendance hours, uh, during spring 2020, where COVID really kind of threw a hamper into the data collection process, and a lot of colleges were um, unable to consistently report on SX05. The solution um, that we came up with is that the um, the 12 hour threshold was suspended for the spring 2020 um, term for colleges. So um, that specific criteria will not, qual will not be part of the spring 2020 term uh, calculations. Okay, and we're, 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 we're in this further discussions how that's gonna apply for, for next year's build. Um, okay. All right, so the next one is a pretty tricky one because there's a couple ways to, to get an educational functioning level gain. So the general criteria here is that uh, one, we're look, only looking at participants, so folks who had the 12 hour threshold who were in ESL, adult basic education, ABE, or adult secondary education, ASE. We're only looking at those people from those programs and then um, they can complete an ESL level by either uh, pre and post testing or through course progression in the same program area. So um, in Costas, this is a pre-calculated field. So we look at to see if they're in one of the three programs and then we look to see if they're flagged as, a, as completing a level. Uh, for the Comus side of things, um, we're looking at uh, whether or not they were in those three program areas. And then um, we look at both the um, assessment file, the SA07, to see what level they were, um, what level they were this year and what level they, um, what level they end up in in the subsequent year. So that's uh, one criteria. So the next criteria would be through the course progression, course advancement, and we track that using uh, the CB21 uh, data element. So we look at their enrollments uh, in, a, in this year to see what CB21 level they are here and in what, uh, what top code the, the course was in. And then we check to see them again the following year to see if any progression is made. So it looks like there's no questions, but uh, the next focus, uh, metric focus we wanted to focus on was the transition to post-secondary, which is also um, a bit tricky. So we're looking at the same 
participants uh, from the ESL games to here who will be counted in the denominator. So again, we're looking only at the ESL, ABE, and ASE programs. Um, and you can transition in two ways. You can transition to post-secondary by either enrolling in a CTE course or enrolling in a non-developmental credit course. Uh, and we, we time stamp it because we are looking for this transition specifically for the first time for that student. Um, so for the CASA CE side, again, we're looking at the same students. Um, there's a flag for if they had a transition to post-secondary that we count. Um, and then we look at our, all of our records to, to make sure that that's uh, happened for the first time in the, in the year that we're looking at. For the COMA side of things, um, we are looking at the same set of students. And then we see if they end up enrolling in a CTE course. So we're looking at whether the top code is marked as vocational or if you know, they end up in a, in a pre-apprenticeship program. And that's something we have to look for in the uh, student file, SB23. Uh, the second criteria can be met uh, by looking at whether they enrolled in a credit course and we use the CDO4 data element for that. And then um, again, we look, we look back in time to make sure that that, uh, that transition happened for the first time. Okay, so the last metrics we wanna focus on is uh, the barriers to employment. And you'll see that there are two charts that are gonna be in the adult education pipeline. So there's a chart for um, if ever flag, and then a chart for flag in the selected year. So the original thinking with these charts is that um, we believe that certain barriers follow you through your life and are more long-term um, and not temporary like some other economic barriers. So they should be so the long-term uh, barrier should be tracked and recorded whenever you have, like if ever you were flagged as that having that barrier. And you can, you can see kind of the distinction here where we have some longer term barriers that may affect you throughout your life. And then we have the, um, the barriers that may be temporary for you. And I think so when you're, yeah. I was just gonna say when you're coding, if you, you would want to every year for each enrollment, you would want to um, verify the flag in the selected year because that's what it gets counted for each year, right? Whereas if they're ever flagged, they don't necessarily need to be recorded again. Exactly. And these are mainly flagged using um, specific student files that, um, that you can see in the MIS. Terrence, I don't, I, yes, I think the logic is works, but I'm not sure that they're informed. Is there any empirical work or research that supports this decision, Jessica? Yeah, it's definitely a decision um, that was um, inherited uh, based on earlier versions of the launch board. And for consistency sake, that's what, um, that's what was carried over to the adult education pipeline. I'll have to do a little bit more research to see if there was, orig uh, there was originally any work to, to, to think about this on the launch board itself, but it's uh, definitely a legacy thing, Terrence. So um, I don't have access to that now, but I can definitely look into that. Good question, thank you. Okay. So things to look forward to in the new build that is meant to launch, launch by the end of the week. So we'll look forward to that. So um, we talk a little bit about the transition to post-secondary uh, metric and there's like two criteria that, that count as transition. We're actually providing um, two new metrics that break, up, break, the, break that transition up, uh, transition specifically to CTE and transition to non-credit developmental uh, credit coursework and that um, that would hopefully support different institutions that are maybe um, aiming for different things. So that's going to be available in the next build. Um, we also are introducing something uh, we call the top five chart. So there are new charts um, that are going to be available for a few metrics that um, tell you proportionally which 
institutions are the top five in reaching these in re reaching these outcome metrics. So um, right now, if you select, uh, if you're looking at a statewide view and you click one of these metrics, you'll see the top five institutions who met that statewide. Um, and then at the regional level, if you select a region, you'll see um, who are the top five in that region. Um, and uh, hopefully that'll help uh, help start conversations and, and with your with future planning as well. Yeah, we're super excited and a plug for uh, the webinar a week from next Friday, we will definitely be demoing those and people who reviewed it really, really found these to be um, useful and interesting as Jessica said for um, creating conversations and looking to people who might be able to engage in conversations beyond your institution. All right, so um, we're expecting a couple of new data elements from the Chancellor's Office MIS system specifically geared for adult education um, and non-credit. So our initial goal was really, uh, really simple, we thought. So we really just wanted an award data element for high school diplomas um, that are provided by the, uh, the community colleges. Because right now we have a workaround that tracks this in the community college side using um, SB 11. And um, we just thought it might not be the most accurate or um, elegant solution. So we really were trying to levy for uh, a specific award data element that tells us uh, that flags high school diploma. Um, and we also were hoping to update the um, assessment file so that EFL level gains can be tracked uh, within um, within a specific discipline area without having them map that back to the top codes. Um, so what we ended up with after working with um, the MIS folks is that they recommended just having, just starting a whole new uh, file system for adult education. And that is the, um, gonna be the adult education assessment file. It's, um, it's, it's new and um, it, uh, it's gonna be implemented in the summer. It's gonna be started. Uh, so we are gonna have access to these new data files. Um, the pro to doing this is that there's a lot of room for growth if we do wanna have more non-credit adult ed specific data elements added to, uh, to MIS. Um, the con is that the SAO7 file has been moved to this new data file. So it's going to be now named AAO2. And um, that's gonna take some getting used to, but I think in the long run, it might be helpful for uh, adult education and non-credit space so that when we need new data elements, there's a, a space for that. Um, Blair, do you wanna add anything to that? No, just that we're really excited. I think it goes back to some of those points about being able to carve out more space for adult education um, in the in in the realm of the community colleges. So I think that that's that's really exciting um, for us as well. And I just wanted to touch base with Emma on the transitions that are are charted. Yes, they absolutely we chart out of adult education sites um, into the community colleges, those are not just for um, transitions that are made within the community college. Okay, great. Um, so this is just a sneak preview about uh, what the data elements will look like in the AAO2 file. So um, here, the MIS folks kind of merged our request for having the EFL gains broken out by discipline area with, um, with a data value for high school equivalency exam. So you'll see here um, the EFL gains, uh, the EFL gains listed out from E1 to E5, M1 to M6 and S1 to S6 um, that are grouped by the um, discipline area and by the different uh, different levels there. The H1 is specifically for the non-credit high school equivalency exam. 
So if a student passed a GED task or uh, this could be where you, you flag it. Um, next slide, Blair. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, I just wanted to, um, thanks for your patience, Linda, but uh, I don't know the answer to this, Jessica. Would a local community college be able to pull a list of the students in transition from my adult school to that college? Yeah, so the pipeline itself only displays aggregate data. We don't have student level data there. I, we are, um, there have been discussions about colleges being able to do um, data exports using data on demand, um, but that's a process that we would have to work with the, um, with the chancellor's office to, to implement and, and to pull. So um, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't pull specific students, but we can give counts. No problem, Linda. And there, the data is there. It's just a matter of uh, whether we can give it to you or not. So uh, that's kind of the limitations of a public data dashboard. Um, so we, for the SBO2, we were able to provide, we are able to add a specific data award um, for the high school diploma that is, uh, that is um, provided from the, the community college chancellors, uh, the community colleges. So. Um, there's a new data element, SBO2, specifically for high school diploma, and it's the data value is U now, and it's the last, it's going to be the last non-credit award listed. I just want to say, we really see this, just, we're just thrilled. It's taken a good couple of years of discussions to be able to get these elements added into Comus. So um, it isn't that we haven't recognized that they're important, it's just that it's a process of moving um, more than one system along to, to, to join us in, in thinking what is important. So we're delighted that these will be in there. And this is a great time to give a heads up to any of your institutional researchers or whoever's doing that coding, that these pieces are coming down the pipeline for um, next year data collection. I think these may have already been addressed or maybe Jessica, did you? Oh no, there you are. For the spring, um, the COVID-19 up updates. Oh yes, I talked about this briefly. Um, this is just um, talking about how we're, how we're uh, treating the spring 2020 terms differently than the other terms, um, just because we're trying to mitigate the, the issues do, of data collection within the time of COVID. So again, we're just doing away with the, the hour thresholds mainly. Um, so students who are in, enrolled regardless of hours are gonna be counted um, as part of the reportable individuals and participants. We, we still have the top code exclusions and we are still looking at specific program areas, but the, the hour threshold is, is not counted for the spring 2020 term specifically. Um, and we'll provide an update if this is gonna continue on for the following year or not. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Neil is talking about the timing being good. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's been interesting to look at the data and we think that it'll be interesting to continue to look to, at the data for next year as well. And then we just wanted to focus on one quick feature that you'll see in the dashboard is that there's an export feature that you can actually export your um, institutions or your consortia's data into an Excel sheet so that if you want to look at your data more closely or manipulate it in ways that we are not doing that on the dashboard, that that is up to you, that you can really get the data that's um, associated with your um, consortium or region. Uh, we wanted to let you know that we're working on a coding guide to company in this. It will not be as detailed as the MDD, so we're hoping that it'll be more overviewing of information, walking you through some of the key metrics, but at a higher level that will um, help understand sort of the broad nature of um, the, the work that goes into coding and just will be have some coding tips into it and some guidance and a little bit more explanation of, of what to expect and what you might want to put in play and what do you need to know in order again to be able to move into the MDD with a lot of detail. And thanks, Emma, yes. 
Jessica, is the, the question is, is that the same in TE as regards that the students enrolled in 2021 with less than 12 hours um, will be counted in TE data ingested into launch board? Um, not for this bill, Dr. Ellinger. I, it's because we get um, TE data at the program year level. We don't get it broken up by term. So um, for this year, we're kind of um, using what they give us, uh, they gave us for the 1920 uh, data set. We know that we've given you a lot of information, a lot of technical information, uh, partly because we're figuring all of this out and the coding is technical. So we appreciate your patience as we've walked through that. Um, are there any additional questions? Any points of discussion? Please feel free to unmute yourself as well. If not, Jessica, do you want me to stop sharing and we can walk through a couple of those features? Maybe, um, I think there was the, I have to scroll back up. I know that uh, the top five would be a great one. What was the one that was asked earlier about, oh, the disaggregations, if we can show also how things get disaggregated. So I will stop sharing. Sure. Um, okay. So this is a preview of the site that's gonna be live um, in a few days actually. So uh, th these numbers might not match what you are able to access um, publicly. You'll be able to get to the site by just Googling launch board adult education pipeline and, and you'll be able to access this site. So just put, putting that out there, um, this is what we call the home page, and these tiles correspond to the, the step ladder that, that Blair had mentioned earlier about the student bu journey buckets. So I think we wanted to look at specifically the program areas. Um, so before we get into each metric, we're getting taken to the summary view, which is kind of like the infographic high level view. Um, we're not really interested in that right now. It's, it's pretty cool, but let's go to the detailed data view. And this is the page where we have each metric laid out. So the first um, metric here is the participants in the ESL program. So um, what we have here is a time trend view. So we um, started getting the adult education data in 1617. So we've um, just kind of put that as a cutoff for this build. So we're only providing information from 1617 onwards um, just to make it a little bit more consistent. Um, from here, you'll see the time trend view. And if you hover over it, you'll see the counts. Uh, of the number of participants who ended up in this program that we could count. Um, underneath is a little data table that displays the counts as well. The drill downs are available on top of the chart. There's always going to be a drill down for gender, race, ethnicity, as well as age group. So if we click uh, race, ethnicity, we'll see uh, the number of um, each ethnicity that, are, that we were able to find that are in the ESL and then hovering over it provides um, a count of the, um, the specific category as well as the percentage. So how you read this is that, um, let's see, for the American Indian Alaska Native, statewide, we found 1,400 participants who were in this category. 9% of them, which is the 122, um, are taking ESL. So that's how you read that particular uh, percentage point. So that's um, one drill down. You can also have a secondary drill down that specifies between first time and returning students. So first time students is whether is, this is their first time in um, either system, the CASAS or the COMIS data set, or if they're returning, meaning um, they were found in either data sets uh, before the selected year. So that's a quick overview of that. Um, if we want to jump to uh, a progress metric, you can just click this little arrow here and it'll take you to the next section in the student journey, which is progress. And you'll see here uh, completed one or more educational function levels. Um, you'll see here again the time trend. And you'll see that you can, the same drill downs pop up. 
Additionally, for a lot of these outcome metrics, we also could provide a drill down by program type. So if you're just looking, uh, interested in looking at um, whether ESL folks were able to uh, get this educational function level gain, you can just click ESL. And that'll update the chart uh, to display just ESL students. Now I'm trying to navigate to a top five metric and they don't happen until the transition page. So um, what we can see here is uh, top five transitions to uh, post-secondary and you'll see See here, because we allow for an additional year for students to, to meet that transition, we actually have to go back a year to see data. So if we go back to 1819, you'll see um, statewide, these are the top, uh, top institutions that are showing um, students who transition to post-secondary. And um, it is proportional. So these, these values will be very different and um, some smaller institutions will pop up. So it's, it's based on the proportion of students they are able to move into post-secondary. Okay, it looks like we have a few chats there. It was mainly Mostly about you. where they come up, but we have about one. Oh, thanks, um, Holly, for putting that into the chat. So those are people were asking about when the next webinars were coming up. And so the, the full list is in the chat and then you can register in the at the link that Holly um, just popped in there. Uh, so that is super. We are right up at one o'clock and I don't know if anybody has any last questions. Otherwise, I know we're supposed to shut down on time. So I want to take a moment to say, yeah, thank you. Thank you all. It's your interest in, in feedback uh, that really helps to drive a lot of these changes. Uh, so please feel free to send on questions to us when in the PowerPoint we'll have our last, um, on the very last slide, it has our contact information. Feel free to reach out to either of us and we will respond either with the information that you need or we'll, we'll look into it or send on um, the, you know, send you on to someone who might better be able to answer your questions. So um, thank you very, very much. We appreciate your participation. All right, thank you, Blair, and thank you, Jessica, and thank you all very much for attending today's webinar. As um, Blair has mentioned and Holly posted a link to the registration play page, definitely feel, feel free to register for the upcoming webinars. The next one is on April 27th, and it's um, for updates regarding the adult education pipeline. So register for those webinars, as well as all of the webinars that we have listed on that particular page. We also have an evaluation that we will be conducting for Jessica and Blair. So please take a minute or two to complete the evaluation and let them know what you thought about today's webinar. And then also if there are any additional training topics that you think would be beneficial to the CAP Field as a whole. We look at those evaluation scores and the narratives, and we that's how we do our professional development planning. So we use that as a resource to make sure that we are getting you all what you need. So again, thank you all very much for your time. We will post a recording in the next couple of days, as well as a link to the PowerPoint presentation. So if you had to leave for whatever reason, or if you would like to share with colleagues, or if you would even like to come back and reference it you know, for future use, you'll be able to do so. So thank you all very much for your time and your participation and everyone have a great afternoon.